Hello, how's everybody doing? Everybody had a good lunch? Can I get a woo? Okay, that'll do. Um, just to I need to know you're there. It's, it's really important as uh, someone who just soaks up other people's admiration. Um, all right. Uh, buckle up. Um, got a lot of slides here. And uh, it's, a, it's a big old fluff piece, so we're going to have a good time here, I think. Um, right, for starters, here's a list of the things I'm not going to talk about. Okay, I'm not going to talk about analytics, I'm not going to talk about procedurally generated content, not going to get anything about shaders, no VR. Uh, monetization, that's out, or if you're from America, there's going to be no monetization. Um, there's also no premium versus free to play, nothing about Unity plugins, Unity 5.4, actually nothing about Unity at all, um, because I'm going to talk about love. Okay, can I get another woo? woo. Who is at this conference for love? <laughs> a few hands went up. Okay, okay. Now, the way I'm going about this, um, talking about love, more specifically about partnership, okay? Because as my talk's about pitching, um, I want to talk about whether or not, first of all, is partnership for you. And by partnership, I mean a long-lasting, loving relationship between you and somebody else with money. And when I say you, I'm talking specifically, well, okay, I don't know who's necessarily in the audience here. How many developers are in here? I'm assuming there's a big developer conference. All hands up, most hands up. Any, any publishers in the room? Good. Any funders? Angel investor type? Yeah, okay, everybody take note, right? Um, I apologize in advance <laughs> to the two of you if anything untoward comes about here. But basically, if you're a developer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extend my metaphor just a little bit more. Um, basically, this entire talk is one long extended metaphor uh, that joins the ideas of how you deal with business with how you deal about getting into a romantic relationship. Okay? Now, partnership is not for everyone. I will acknowledge that. And I'm not saying you need it, or, but if you're the sort of person who is here and you've been trying for a while to find a partner, if you haven't got there, if you've been trying dating after dating service, if you've been trying all kinds of different methods and tricks in order to get in with the publishers, then maybe there's something in this talk that might help you out moving forward. So when it comes to partnership, when you're talking about getting funds for things, there's usually three different places where that comes in. One is where you've got a bit of a game and you want to make more of a game. When you've got a lot of a game and you want to do the rest of the game, and thirdly, when you got all of a game and you want to start thinking about the next game. So what is important in each of these situations, if in fact you are seeking outside funding, is that you are going to need a pitch. But what's important about this pitch is that you, first of all, there's no point in lying in a pitch. Because lying, all it does is you get found out later. I don't know if anybody here has seen a romantic comedy. But it never works out for the guy when he starts off with a big old affair and uh, razzle-dazzle and he makes something up and then he gets found out halfway through the film. And then he has to come up with some ridiculous stunt that gets him back in with the girl. Once you've lost the girl at the beginning, you can't pull a ridiculous stunt and get back in with the publisher anymore or with the funder. All right? So what I want to do here first is, actually, I should probably do this disclaimer. Um, before I get started, um, I've got a slide full of mixed metaphors, gender stereotypes, blatant objectification, and some romantic comedy logic. Uh, all the way through this, like I said, I'm comparing a romantic relationship to a business relationship to get you thinking about how far into the future your relationship, your drop in a pitch on somebody's lap, is actually headed. And so, um, now I understand as well, this is a diverse world. I understand that there are all types of relationships out there. I already addressed you might need a partner, you might not. But there's different ways in which people get together. And the fact in, in this particular uh, presentation, I have taken the developers and I've cast them as the boys. Okay? Now, I'm not saying developers are boys. I'm not doing anything about gender stereotypes. These are my developers. Even the girls in this audience, that's you. Okay? And the fact is, you're a bunch of teenage boys who have no idea what you're doing in the world of business, but you're out to get some tonight. Okay? Can I get another woo for that? Anybody want that? Okay. 
Now, it could have been this. I could have gone with the developers and girls, but it's going with these guys. All right, so there's many different types of developers who are working within their own system. They know they've, I'm not going to tell you what's going to make your game better. I'm assuming you've got that under control. You've got your monetization under control. What you have reached is the point in your process where you're like, geez, if we want to go from three people to 30 people, or if we want to go from 1,000 likes on Twitter to a million likes on Twitter, maybe what we need is to hook up with somebody. Okay? And this presentation is all about getting these guys to hook up with these ladies. Okay? Again, sorry, guys. To you too. Okay? So our investors, publishers, funders, whatever we're talking about, whatever we're going after, they are the prize that these contestants are after, okay? So this is where all our, my, my dating metaphors are going to start coming. Well, they might come unthreaded as time goes on. And if anybody leaves the room, I'm completely sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. But these bunch of bozos are trying to get with these bunch of sophisticated, smart, confident, experienced ladies that all know exactly what they want. And they're going to see developer after developer coming through. Some of them they're going to chew up and spit out. And some of them they're going to stick with. And they go, that guy's got a spark. I may stick with him for a little while. But what's important here, the, the point that I'm trying to make, is that this is not the goal of doing a pitch. This is not the goal of a first encounter. And this is also not the goal of a first encounter. We're not looking for a one-time hookup here. We are looking for a long-lasting relationship. You're looking for a life partner. You're looking for someone you're going to sign a very long contract with that is going to boost you up when you're down, you boost them up when they're down, the two of you work together. And if you keep your friendship and your relationship on the right level, and you pitch as though that is what you're aiming for, you will have a much better chance of achieving it. So splitting that up, if you're only thinking as far as this guy, trying to get with Stifler's mom, then, which one of you guys is Stifler's mom? <laughs> okay, this guy, now, comparing these two images, right? Now, I don't know, is anybody in here married? Few? Yeah? Okay. Now, when you look, when I look for, I'm going to not speak for you, I'm going to speak for myself. Looking for a wife, um, I wanted somebody who was, first of all, a good friend, understood me. You know, we can have a clash every now and then, but the right answer comes out on top. We can have difference of opinions, but we can listen to one another. And all those things are really important in a relationship, and it has to be built on honesty. This here, is built on lies and trickery, right? This is you on a one-night stand thinking, what can I say to this person to make this relationship last 24 hours at most? And then I can skip out in the middle of the night and phone my friends, okay? Now, what you think you may be looking for is trying to nail the pitch directly in front of you. But once you have nailed the pitch, you have to remember that after that comes another date and another date and eventually a contract. And then it moves on and on and on further through uh, a very long period of time. So what you need to remember is if you walk up to a publisher and you drop your game on their lap and say, play my game, you're going to love it, and then you're going to be my publisher. That is the equivalent of you walking up to a lady in a bar and dropping your trousers and say, what do you think? Huh? Right? It's more than just impressing them with the first visit. It is about building a friendship, a relationship that's going to last a very long time. If you're thinking too much like this going into a pitch, you're going to end up like this guy. Okay, At home, having sex with pies. Right, now, me. Who's this guy giving us relationship advice? Now, um, you probably, none of you know me. It's my first Unite conference. Um, I'm not even a pretty big deal in the UK games um, area. I'm from Belfast, although you can't tell by my accent. Here, basically, here's me. About six years ago, I made a game called Hector Badge of Carnage. Pause for applause. None. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. He actually has nothing to do with this story, but I like showing that slide just in case I get pause, even pity pause. Um, okay. 
basically, Hector was a point-and-click adventure in the style of the old uh, LucasArts games. It, was, uh, it came out on the iPhone 3.0, and it was built in Objective-C, uh, which building an adventure creator in Objective-C, let me tell you, um, I could go on for a while. Um, anyway, Hector was noticed by Telltale Games, and Telltale Games picked it up and helped us fund episodes two and three of that game. Now, that had nothing to do with me pitching. It just had to do with making a really great game to start with. Um, that launched somewhere between Back to the Future and Jurassic Park, and about two steps before uh, The Walking Dead, which, of course, changed uh, Telltale uh, forever. But back when, like, I knew them back before they were cool. Let's put it that way. All right. So working with Telltale Games gave me enough clout to, uh, actually, I want to add this in. Am I a rich man because of that? Absolutely not. I'm going to move on to my next game, which was called Schrodinger's Cat and the Raiders of the Lost Quark. Huh? Huh? I don't, even, I don't know if that's genuine. I don't think that was genuine. OK. Schrodinger's Cat uh, was a quantum physics platformer puzzler in the style of Rayman meets Lemmings, which um, was an action-adventure game which involved picking up elementary particles, mashing them together into gadgets in order to stop the anti-strange particle from releasing a Quinn Quavingantillion of himself all over the world, right? So it's all very deep. It's like, you know, if Big Bang Theory is here, my game is sort of like about here. And so a very niche audience, you know, quantum physics for kids. It, uh, am I a rich man because of it? No, not that either. But hey, I made it in Unity. So can I get a round of applause for these guys? <laughs> right. That picked up the, uh, the interest of Team 17, who ended up publishing that. And that got onto three platforms, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and Steam. And again, am I a rich man? Not yet. I'm still working on it. But the clout from working with both Telltale and Team 17 opened me up to a pitch for a new game, which got me in front of these funders here. And they are funding what I'm doing right now. Am I a rich man because of it? Temporarily. I have just enough money to make the game that I'm making right now. So th again, this comes down to your definition of success. Is it uh, being filthy, stinking rich, or having just enough to make the next one? I consider myself to be a success in my own mind. Anyway, the game I'm working on here, uh, my latest, I'm about six months into development, about six months away from uh, having something really, really nice and concrete to show, is a game called Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa is a, um, it's part uh, action heist game and part speed forgery game. So what you're doing is you're breaking into 15th century strongholds in Renaissance Italy. Uh, you are lifting paintings, but before you leave the room, you create a quick forgery of it and drop the forgery into the painting, the frame left behind. And that's to fool the guards into thinking the painting was never stolen in the first place. So the whole game is a bit of slapdash forgery. It's a bit of uh, Dan Brown meets Terry Pratchett with a bit of steampunk thrown in. So I've now got enough to me keep me and four or five others employed for the next little while. This game's also made in Unity, by the way. And that's the last slide that shows the Unity logo. All right. Finally, uh, this hasn't technically been announced yet, but I don't mind because I like you guys. BBC Connected Studio put out a pitch recently, a pitch, a tender for pitches, where they were looking for an idea for games for grown-ups. Stuff in the neighborhood of Dear Esther and Life is Strange and something that gives you the feels or something that changes your perception of the world. And so in a day, me and another fellow from Northern Ireland, we got together and we whipped together a pitch jam. We put together a one-day idea that we nailed off and now we've got this idea, Disposable Steve, that we're going to be making in the next four months. Uh, this one is a game about the near future where you're able to use a 3D printer to make disposable clones of yourself. But when you can do that, you can also put pieces of your brain inside those. They go off and use them, and you're left empty-headed. So uh, the, it's, a, it's a game about loss and change and all kinds of other wonderful things and uh, what happens when all of your pieces of your brain go wandering off into the world and come back and the vessel that started off goes missing. So it's the brains are looking for the man. Right. So what I was trying to show you with all that uh, history was I have basically 
floated through life on pitches. Uh, I haven't found it that difficult to acquire, like I haven't been hammering funder after funder after funder or publisher after publisher. A lot of the times, just a good, natural, honest approach and an enthusiasm toward the work that you're doing with the right person ends up with a fortuitous relationship and you end up moving forward as a company. Aside from all those things, what's all that? Oh, there's Telltale. Right. Yes, I also competed in the very big indie pitch. Has everybody done one of those? Anybody? Yeah, those are good fun, aren't they? Those are three minutes at a time, and you're just banging it out after you know, press person after industry person. I'll get to that a little bit later. And this little mock judge down here, that was me being a mock judge at a pitching event at some event in Northern Ireland. And there was no logo for it to fit the rest, so I just made that in Photoshop. Uh, it's a little squeaky hammer. I quite like it. I may make a game called Mock Judge. Right. So all of those things, being a judge, learning what not to do, what to do, I've seen a lot of pitches come through, and I've seen a lot of people complain about why their pitches aren't working. So I'm hoping that if I can bestow upon you going about this idea of thinking about yourself as somebody who's worth marrying rather than someone who's worth a good old role at an event like this, that will extend your idea of what, is, what this relationship is all about. So I want to take you through a relationship uh, in terms of business, OK? I want to think of yourself. You're the developer. You're that boy. You've just locked eyes across the room with the lady of your dreams. And I'm going to take you through the road to marriage. Now, this is the road to marriage. It's full of ups and downs and emotional turmoil, as you can see. Uh, it's not really an analytics graph, but uh, there you go. Oh, I mentioned analytics. <clears throat> OK, first sight is going to lead to the big day at some point. And we're going to call the big day launch day of your game. Okay? And I'm going to assume that the person you're going after is a publisher, just for the sake of putting a name on it. Okay? Now, at a first sight, no, don't do this. Okay? That's, not a good, that's not a good first impression. Sorry. First sight is probably something more like this. This is what we'd like it to be. That says you, and that's the lady of your dreams, and you're sort of locked eyes across the ship, and the two of you are thinking, this may work. Actually. More often than not, it's a little more like this. <laughs> okay? You're aware of the publisher long before they're aware of you. Okay? That publisher shows up at an event like this and waits for the moment that somebody's going to spring on them and drop a game in their lap and start going, thinking this is going to be a lifelong relationship. Right. A little more like this. First encounter, this is probably what we'd like it to be. Ah, that's a GIF. Ah, okay. Um, this is what we'd like. And don't make it come off like this, OK? Again, if you come on too strong, you smell of desperation. The ladies, they can smell the desperation, and they run the, way, the other way. They don't want that, OK? You want to come off as cool and casual, ready for a first meeting, because what makes the best spouse in the end is probably a really good friend, someone you get along with on a basis. Like, you don't have to be. You don't have to be friends, but it definitely helps. OK? Your first date comes along. And uh, in terms of this, I know I chose the movie 50 First Dates. And that's because most of the time at an event like this, that's pretty much what a publisher goes through, and possibly the developer as well. You line up one after another, after another, and after another, and you hope that one of those things is going to turn into something. Okay? If you're lucky, you get to the point of first kiss. Now, what I'm calling first kiss, this is the moment where you realize that there is a spark between you and this partner that's going to come together. You think, there may be something here. This person's going to change my mind about the way I'm running my business. Then this person may come about, and they're going to change my business. And as a result, you, you may lean in. They may not be feeling the same thing, like Scarlett there. But you need to manage that in the early days. You're like, we've nailed it. I think this could be the one. That's where you first have an inkling. That moves on to a dating period. And the dating period is you're, you're exchanging emails every so often. You're putting things together. You're, uh, you're sending them the occasional build of flowers and chocolates and things like that. The, uh, on the other end, when the two of you do get together, in terms of dating, it's not a case of what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? It's more like, what do you want to do? We're going to go for Thai food, and you're going to go to the carnival, and you're going to buy me a freaking bear. Like, that's, that's the relationship. Sometimes it's like, I know exactly what I want out of this relationship. And you, as the little guy, is like, OK, we'll do that. right? But if you can get yourself into a position where you know that she's the one that's going to spark your business, it may actually become a real thing. 
the two of you, the best situation is if the two of you know exactly what's going on, you're gelling, you send a build, they like the build, they make suggestions, you're happy to get them. You confer over opinions, and the best opinions come out on top. And you respect each other. Okay? Then comes meeting the parents. And that's when this becomes really serious. It's like, I think you should come back to our offices. We should have a meeting. We should, you should meet the CEO. We should make all this happen. And it really moves forward to this one. This is the, one of the make or break points of your relationship. Um, finally comes the proposal. Again, we want a situation that's a little like this, but it's probably a little more like this, just to do a bit of the swaying back and forth, OK? A proposal is dropped into your lap, and usually a prenup follows immediately after. So this is the two of you deciding that we're going to actually tie the knot, and this is exactly how it's going to go down. Bit of a negotiation period. You become engaged. Not sure what to do with that one. But let me also add, you're not just engaged, but you're also pregnant. Okay? And the pregnancy is the game. So the two of you are working toward, first of all, a marriage, which is one of the most stressful days of your entire lives, and the birth of your baby, which is one of the most exhausting days of your entire lives. So you had better be sure that you are with someone that is going to support you, and it's not going to be a constant whiplash of griping back and forth. And by the way, in this relationship, it's the developer that carries the baby. Moving on to the planning session, could go smoothly, unlikely. It's usually something like this. It's a long, drawn-out process where you're fighting bugs and you're tearing things apart and you're putting things back together. You're doing last-minute builds. You're trading things on QA. You're deciding on localization. And you're picking out plates and you're picking out napkins and place settings and who's going to come to your party. Okay? It gets more stressful as you approach, finally, the big day. And on your magical day, you can finally have the wife and the child that you always wish you wanted. This is you right here. This could be you. Look how happy he is. <laughs> All right. So that, as opposed to thinking of the one night stand, think about the first date, anything like that, you have to realize that this is what, will you look at my game? That's here. And this is the launch of your game. You have gone through all those processes and all that stress. And you had better make sure that when you make that choice to join forces with somebody, that they're the right person to join forces with. And it's blissful. Now, the road's even longer if you include all the cyber stalking you did beforehand, which is picking out the publisher that you want to be with. There's lots of different places it can go wrong. But when we do reach the end, uh, yeah, did I say the end? That's not the end yet. The big day is not the end. And a lot of people forget that. It's like we get to launch day, and then we can all go home. No, not a chance. You get to launch day, and then you've got another set period of time that you're going to keep on moving forward. So this section here is actually quite short compared to eternity, depending on the contract you sign. I didn't sign an eternal contract. I don't think you signed an eternal contract, did you? No, sort of, no. <laughs> right. So you have to make sure that the relationship you're forming is one like this and not one like this. All right. So And the point is, if your mentality changes, where you're, you used to be pitching for the first kiss. Maybe you're thinking about pitching for a contract down the road, but you have to be thinking, is this the person, is this the company that my, that my pitch, that my game is going to sit well within? OK? You're heading for eternity, folks. Now, some of the things you need to be aware of along the way. Number one, you're not her first, and you won't be her last. OK? Now, this is where the polyamorous marriages comes in. The developer is going to work with a bunch of different publishers. The publisher is going to work with a bunch of different developers. You're going to have a happy union at the point of your marriage, at the point of launch day, and the contract and the uh, engagement is signed. But you won't be the first. You're going to be one of, the, one of her husbands. You're going to be one of, of 18. You're going to be one of 150. You might have a chance of being the favorite, and you want to hope to be in one of those positions. But you have to be aware that you're not going to be the only one. No publisher signs one client. And if they do, they're the wrong publisher for you, unless they work in-house. Right? So they're going to be, the thing is, both of you are going to be faithful to the baby, but you're going to be open to the marriage. So that's one thing to consider. Second one, wedded bliss is not for everybody. Okay? Now, what I mean by this, this comes on both sides. This is the publisher and the developer. And I said a little bit of this about, uh, at the beginning. But 
the fact is some publishers work in a way where they want to see if they can die with the most toys. Okay, that means, uh, yeah, I'll take you, I'll take you. Anybody got a game? Yeah, come on up here. Put it in the box. And then they throw 150 games out over the course of a year. And if one of them sticks, then they've won. And all the rest of them get a letter to the press. And then it gets dropped. And it's like, nah, that's the way the company works. That's, uh, that's the way it goes. Now, that's, that's the, your, your man-eater mentality, if you want to look at it that way, uh, to extend the metaphor further. Um, you, may be, you may be looking for the same thing. You may be looking for something that makes a quick buck, and then you get out of there. And that's fine, too. But just be aware, my goal is to get something that I care about and someone that I work well with. If it's not yours, that's fine. And finally, I want to add here that the strongest swimmer gets the prize. Okay? And what I mean by that is, I don't know if you've ever heard someone saying, ah, oh, publishers, all they do, they just, they just want a reason to chuck your thing in the bin. Uh, or agents, or you know, book publishers, or funders, or anything like that. You send in an application, it's like, I'm sorry, I was rejected again. And you think, they're just out there to find a problem so they can toss it in the bin. And the fact is, that is absolutely true. And the reason that is true, I don't mean that in an insulting way. What I mean is, they get 300 submissions a week, and they might have to choose 12 for the year. So if there is something in your pitch that renders your entire idea pointless, if they look at that and they go, oh, this guy couldn't even be bothered to spell monetization properly, then it's like, no attention to detail. Boom, on to the next one. They have to filter through so many things in order to get your game on there. And so what you need is to make sure that your paper pitch and your speech pitch as you go is impeccable throughout. They want perfection. They want to know. See, the best way I ever saw it put, um, it, was a, it was actually, I was at a book publishing seminar. And it was, uh, you know, you got a novel, come and meet the agents, come and meet this group. And, and they were just talking about the process of how they work as a company. And they were talking about this exact same thing. You, yeah, loads of stuff comes in onto the desk, and sometimes it's based on how you feel that day, and sometimes it's based on the font that the thing was chosen in. And you like to think that everything gets an equal opportunity, but the fact is that if they have to filter through that process so much, what they want to make sure is that the one that they choose is one that they are 100% super fans of. If they have to fight to think of why they want to keep this on the table, there's no point in keeping it on the table. Your pitch and your product has to be so impeccable that, of course, it's going to stay on the table. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And in fact, as a baseline, it's 100% correct, and I see a big potential for a moneymaker in it. And whatever the reasons are that the publisher chooses for the filtration process, they want something that is so impeccable that the baseline is 100%, and it goes beyond that. So if you can keep that in mind, that's you being the strongest swimmer. And you're getting that one spot in Q2 2016 that's going to take you to the other side because all the spots around it are taken and they've already tossed everybody else out. So if you want to win, swim hard. Now, for the rest of the presentation, um, I want to focus on this section right here, which is let's assume that you are courting people. You've got your game that's in a uh, bit form. You've got something that's in uh, like prototype or demo stage, maybe even a vertical slice. And what you've got is an opportunity that you want to get yourself a first date with the lady of your choice. OK? So skipping out, assuming you've got an amazing product, I'm just going to talk about how first impressions go. Now, first impressions probably are the expression Never get a second chance to make a first impression. I think that's attributed to Oscar Wilde, maybe Will Rogers. I first saw it in a Head & Shoulders shampoo commercial, I think. Um, but it's true. It's like you, you're either going to nail it or you're not. And you can, yeah, it, you walk up, you say the right thing, you say the wrong thing, and you can beat yourself up for the rest of your life having mixed up and being unprepared, said the wrong game, said the wrong company, forgotten the name, that kind of a thing. So the key is figuring out how to deal with situations where you are prepared versus not prepared. Okay, So I'm going to take this through some first impression scenarios. Number one is the love letter. Now, the love letter is my um, metaphorical application form. 
Okay, it's application for funding. It's a uh, it's a letter to a, you know a website. Please send your submissions here. We get all these submissions a week. We'll let you know if you've been accepted or rejected. But what you've got is an open invitation to send me text, not me specifically. Those guys. Okay, so to send text. You've got a lot of time to think about it. This isn't an impromptu thing. You shouldn't be hammering this out in the evening and banging it out and not reading it over. This is your first scenario. OK? So if you've got all the time in the world to write this letter, it means you've got the chance to make it poetry. You've got the chance to think about it and, and concoct the perfect wording to get your point across of how amazing your game is. OK? Um, now, you also want to keep it true. Okay, I'm not telling you to lie. I'm not. I mean, you're allowed to. You're allowed to guess at how well it's going to be based on uh, hard data, but you want to keep it absolutely true. Don't promise something that you can't do because that'll come out and it'll all unravel toward the end. Okay. You also want to tailor it toward the target. Now, tailoring it toward the target. What I mean is, uh, if this is the sort of company, you know, that makes war games as opposed to match threes. Now, first of all, if you make match threes and you're applying for a war game publisher, that's not going to work. If you're, these guys do 8-bit games and you're doing 3D, that's not going to work. You should know what this is for. You know, that's, that's basic research. I'm gonna, uh, skipping over that, I'm going to talk about specifically if these guys lean toward feelies, if these guys weren't learn, lean toward uh, just simple uh, platformer puzzlers, that kind of a thing. It's the power of wordplay. Now, this line here. Can anybody tell me what movie that describes? Give you a couple seconds. I got half a brick of young Belagan cheese in my fridge. Anybody who figures it out. Hey? There it is. That's the Wizard of Oz. Okay, transported to a surreal landscape, a young girl kills the first person she meets and then teams up with three strangers to kill again. All of that is absolutely true. Now, it's, I'd be curious as who tunes into that movie and is sorely disappointed by what's there. But what I am saying is that the wording in that is intriguing, makes me want to see that film, and then I, of course, have to deliver on that film. Okay? So it's not wrong, it's not a lie, but it is tailored. Second text-based scenario is the matchmaking site. Okay. By this, I'm not. Talk I'm talking about something more along the lines of a meet and match system. Uh, you know, you're coming to an event like this. Usually, there's a meeting system that's built into it, and you are um, you have a choice of saying, you know, meet. You get five meets, and you can hook up with these people. People can hook up with you. That sort of a thing, right? Again, first of all, make your profile the sort of thing that someone will respect when they actually go to start doing research on you. Fill in your photo, fill in your company logo, fill in all the information of what makes your game special and what's going on. You don't want to end up like Ricky here, who's decided to do a really bad Tumblr, uh, not Tumblr, what did I say? Uh, Tinder. Um, I don't know if anybody swipe right for that guy. No? Hands up? No? OK. Right. There is such a thing as being too honest, obviously. but. What's important is that every piece of information that extends between the two of you, especially at the beginning, has got to be uh, an impression of what you are as a whole. Don't say things like, I'm sure you've heard the expression, show, don't tell. Okay? When you say show, don't tell, that's a movie expression or it's, a, it's a, even a cutscene expression. Don't have two people sit there talking about what's going on. Actually do the thing. Okay? But where, the way I like to use show, don't tell in a situation like this is don't put in your pitch, my game is hilarious. Okay? If you're hilarious in the pitch, you don't have to say that your game is hilarious because the hilarity has leached out into your marketing and into your profile and into your campaign. If you're if your profile is, uh, or sorry, if your game is dark, if your game is serious, if your game uh, wants to convey a certain message, if it's set in Victorian times, then use Victorian language and put that into your, all of your messages that go out. And what that means is that person says, this guy is not just into this game. He's, that's, that's his life. That's his passion. That's his uh, enthusiasm. So when you show and don't tell, you put more of your game leaking out into different areas of uh, your marketing plan. Hector was a great example. I put Hector up at the very beginning there. The most fun we had with Hector was the marketing campaign. 
Because, now I didn't tell you about Hector, and I know everybody who applauded was, uh, was just pretending to be nice to me, because uh, we were just starting out. Um, but Hector is a loud mouth, lout of a, you know, he's a drunken, vulgar cop who's lazy, he doesn't want to do his job. In fact, the, the case that he's out to solve is actually quite easy, but he can't be arsed to do it. Um, so the entire thing is one big wisecrack fest, and he's negative about everything. That got into the marketing as well. And so when everybody else was out there going, 10 out of 10, editor's choice, best game ever, come check out my game, we're awesome. All the marketing that we did was like, uh, it's half decent. It's not too great. You know, if, if you can try it if you like. You know what? I actually honestly don't care if you like it. I only care if you buy it. And we would say like really direct, ridiculous things like that that nobody ever says in marketing. And in fact, it ended up working for us as an overall character for the marketing campaign, as well as when you sit in a room and you've got best game ever, best game ever, best game ever, best game ever, it's not bad, best game ever, best game ever. Which guy are you going to go to? It's like, I want to see what this guy's confidence is that he can go with a not bad, a, you know, a three out of five at best, we would put on our own campaigns. In fact, the other thing we would do is when um, somebody would do a review of the game, they'd say, it's, uh, this, this game is hilarious, it's a throwback to the old LucasArts, blah, 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 we'll give it four out of five stars. And we'd get on and we'd say, what, four out of five, you're kidding me, three out of five at best. And we would argue down. And what that did, was it made the users, the players, come on and say, no, 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 it's actually not three out of five, it's five out of five. So the users were arguing up against us. And that's the best kind of marketing that you can get, is when the users are doing more of your job than you have to do. That's a totally separate issue, but I love talking about it anyway. All right, uh, by the way, pop quiz, when you have one of those matchmaking sites out there, timing, when is the best time to put the pitch, if you've identified the one, when is the best time to put that pitch into play? Okay? Suppose you're in Unite 16, you got day one, day two, and day three. When are you going to schedule that meeting that you think is going to be the ideal one? Anybody? Hmm? What's that? Day one. day one? Actually, day one at 2.30 p.m. That's the answer. And the reason is for this. Okay? Day one and two. That's drinking zone, which kills the mornings of day two and three. Nobody cares about that time. By day three, all the business has been done. Most people have left early. So nothing's going to happen there. Now, when you arrive on day one, you're going to be nervous. Now, what you should do is book a handful of meetings with similar companies that you're not so precious about. Just so you can test your pitch, try a couple things, bumble your way through it. You'll learn certain ways that you can do a bit of phrasing that gets a laugh out of people or whatever it is, something that's going to make it feel a lot more casual. But at the beginning, that's your practice zone. You're going to get into the own zone. You're going to have lunch about here. Everybody's going to be digesting after lunch and say, all right, let's get serious about this stuff. And then you sit down in the nail zone, 2.30 to 4.30. That's probably the best you're going to do. So if you can get the, the one to show up at that time, uh, that's perfect. Now, this here, this is a hazy zone here, because sometimes you get to the end of day one, you get drinking, you've heard all the hangover stories, and you're like, I really have to get some business done before I go back to my office. So you might have something working in there if these spots are all taken. But just keep that in mind. And by the way, if anybody requests a meeting from you in either of those places, they're from user acquisition. Come on, that was a joke. OK, moving on. All right. First impression scenario three, the bachelor auction. Yeah, I put Magic Mike in my presentation, so what? Um, what we got here is a situation quite like what I'm doing right now. Okay, You've got a certain, number, a certain amount of time, you've got a room full of people who might be interested in a job, and you've signed up for it. It's like a pitch fest. Okay, Now, this is one of the few scenarios where the publisher might see the developer first. You may not even know that your perfect partner is in the room, but they may see you shining on stage and say, I'm going to talk to that guy after the show. Now, in this case, you're putting yourself out there. You've got plenty of time to prepare. And you're giving it your all in the hopes that somebody slips a dollar down your trousers at some point toward the end of the night. OK? Now, true love is possible. Stranger things have happened. But since we're on the subject of presentations, such as the one I'm doing now, OK? Has anybody sat through a presentation that looks like this? Sit through a presentation where everything the presenter said is also written on the slide? 
And most people read it about four times faster than they speak. So while I'm standing up in front of you, still reading aloud the words on the screen, you've probably already finished, which means you're kind of bored waiting for me to catch up. And worse, I've given away the fact that I can't even talk about the merits of my own product without being told what to say by a prompter. Okay? If your slides look like this, you throw out the slide deck and you start again. Boring ass slide. Okay? Instead, you want slides that look like this. Okay? They have spectacular art about the things that you do. They have one or two words on it, and you talk around those words. So that what people see is spectacular stuff, something to read, not that much to read, then they look back at you. And so they're focused on you the entire time. Or if you're not doing a very good job, they're focused on Twitter or something. But at least your chances are better that they're not reading and having moved on going, get on with it. I could have got this in a book. Okay? Scenario number four is the speed date. Again, we had a few people in the back who've done these um, speed dating, you know, the, the very big indie pitch type things. That's where you've got, say, three minutes at a time to impress a table full of judges with whatever you can say during that time that's going to impress them. Now, this takes some preparation, and it's a different kind of preparation than a bachelor auction. It's um, by condensing a pitch to three minutes, it makes sure that you're not stuck in some kind of a script and you have to actually boil down what your game is about. And the thing is, if you can't explain your game in a sentence, and if you can't explain your game in three minutes or less, then your game's too complicated. Okay? We've come to the age of games where you're supposed to be able to hand it to somebody and they should be able to figure out how to do it in 10 seconds or less. Or else it's some other property and it's a bigger investment and the time that's already gone into it uh, is, is, is worth investing in. But if you're a brand newbie on the, on the block and you show up and you're babbling through a whole bunch of other issues, then you are going to lose the interest of the people who are up there. Um, by doing this, what you need to keep in mind is that very little is probably going to come out of it. All you're going to do is make yourself present to the 25 or so industry specialists that are running around the room. They might notice you, they might not, but what you're getting out of it is your elevator pitch. You're practicing what works and what doesn't, and the more of these that you do, the better you'll get at casually saying, yeah, uh, this is what my game is about, and I can knock it out in a sentence. And, you know, the elevator pitch is called the elevator pitch for a reason. I mean, you might be going up three floors or you might be going up 30. And you have to be able to gauge the amount of time that you've got to dump your game into their ear so that by the end of it, they're still excited about it. Okay? There's a blind date. Now, a blind date is sort of a friend setting you up. Now, what I consider a blind date, there's two different questions. Me saying, would you mind setting me up? is a totally different question than, or a totally different statement than you guys should meet, okay? By you guys should meet, that's more like, oh, you're in computers, you're in computers, you guys might get along. And I don't know if anybody else has a mom like mine, but they're the sort who's like, you should talk to Jeff, he's in computers. And when you do that, it's like, turns out he installs RJ45 cables as opposed to me who makes video games. But to them, it's like the digital world is that thing over there and they're still immersed in the only other two careers that are available at their time, which was blacksmithing and dentistry. So, um, so yeah, when digital became this new thing, now, that's, that's what we all became a part of, along with the builders and the hardware specialists and the people who do banking software and the Oracle database, you know, all of that. We're all the same to, to that sort of a blind date. So those you have to be a bit wary of. However, if you say, would you mind setting us up, that's a bit like, can I have her phone number? Okay? And that works kind of for the both of you. The person who's giving the phone number has to respect you enough to give it to them and believe that the relationship that they have with that publisher is not going to be damaged by bringing you up to the table. So you almost have to woo your friend more than you have to woo the other person. Right? Eyes locked across a crowded room. Talked about this one a little bit. And this is sort of like the party mate. You know, you may meet one another um, and, and not even know this person was in the room or what they did. And it's going to bring me through to number seven, which is the date you didn't even know was a date. Six and seven kind of go hand in hand. You can end up having drinks with somebody at an event like this. You know, everybody's at the party afterwards, and you've been talking for a half an hour, and right at the end of it, they're like, I like your style, kid. Here's my card. Boom. And you didn't even realize that the enthusiasm that you were talking about your game is getting through in everything that you're saying, and they realize how genuine you are. That's going to sell you more than you knowing who that person is 
putting on a fake face for the entirety of the conversation. And as soon as it's done, you're like, oh, thank God that's over. Uh, when I first started working with um, Team 17, um, now, I made Schrodinger's Cat. I was making it for mobile because I didn't know uh, if I was going to be able to build up into Xbox, PlayStation, Steam, anything like that. I thought, I thought mobile is a safe place to get started at least because I know there's a low bar for entry. Let's be honest. You know, I pay my 60 pounds to the App Store and now I can get my stuff on there. I don't have to go through any kind of major process. Now, that's, uh, you know, that's low-hanging fruit, let's be honest. But at the time, I didn't know what kind of a game I had. Now, when I met up with Team 17, it was one of these meet and match uh, websites. It was at Game Connection Paris about three years ago. And when I got together with them, it was more like, I like Team 17. I've grown up with worms. I'd like to meet those guys. And that was what the meeting was about. That was me just being a, a fan. I was just like, oh my god, you guys, it's so great to see you. And so we started to talk, and they say, oh yeah, we're doing all this great stuff, and Worms WMD is coming out. And then I'm like, they're like, what are you up to? And I started to say, well, I'm making this quantum physics platformer puzzler. It's a bit quirky. It's a bit crazy. And I pulled it out, and I had a little bit of a sample, and I showed them how it works and, and all the humor that was within it. And at the end of the meeting, they're like, you know, we're a few months away from announcing we're starting a publishing branch of our company. Why don't you give us a call when we do that? And so that entire time, I was pitching without knowing it was a pitch and nailing it because I was excited about my own product, and I didn't care who knew. I didn't care who I was talking to. I didn't tailor the pitch to that person to think they were going to buy it. It was simply, let me tell you about this great thing that I've got. That goes a heck of a lot further than a prepared script. All right, we've got about uh, 13 minutes left, and I'm going to go a little bit. Yes, this is where we want to be. We want to be so prepared that you can pitch unprepared. Like, I had a, a friend who once said to me that the best way to do a pitch or to practice a pitch is to do it while the TV is on, while the family is having dinner, while you're talking to a six-year-old who's in the middle of playing Legos, things like that, because a pitch... The thing is, if you're going to do a pitch anywhere, as opposed to a prepared situation like I'm doing to you now, your random pitch off the street, there's going to be distractions. There's going to be things that crop up. There's going to be a friend that comes out of the woods. So you've got to make sure that your message works constantly and that you can do it without losing your place. And it's not easy, but the more you talk to people about the great stuff that you're doing, the easier it's going to be to talk further about the great stuff you're doing. I talk naturally about it. Okay. So tip one for how to nail this, number one, don't be shy about showing off your package. Okay? Tell people your idea. Okay? I can say to you, there's no new idea under the sun. You know, that may make some of you angry. It's like my idea is something that you've never seen before. Most ideas are built on two other ideas mashed together with a third idea with a twist. In fact, I recommend that as a first pitch is give them something stable to stand on. If you say it's Call of Duty meets Candy Crush with a twist of Jetpack Joyride, okay? If that's your game, those three games are amazing. And that person may say, I can't see how that works, but I'm willing to hear more. If instead I come to you and I say, it's this amazing game, it's color, and it's light, and it's magical, and you've never played any game like this before, and it takes three fingers and a controller to do it, then it's like, I've got nothing to base that on. I have, I have, I have nothing to cling to. I need something to cling to in order to move forward with this conversation. Um, the other side of this, don't, sh don't be shy about showing off your package, is you can't build in the dark. Okay? You may think you've got the most amazing thing that anybody has ever seen, but if you cover it up and you keep it out of the light, it will not grow. And you will never get honest opinions on it if the only person you show is your mother. Okay? This is first-time developer, easy stuff. You've got to do the blind test. You've got to do the strangers. You've got to hand it to a friend who didn't know you were building it and say, try this thing out and see what you think. Don't tell them you did it. And if they say, it's crap, then you've got an honest opinion. If you proceed it with, this is something I made, you'll get, that's good, and you don't know if that's good, or if that's good for something you made, right? So, that's building in the dark. Now, my philosophy, personally, is to tell everybody about my ideas as early as possible. Number one, because I love my own ideas, and I love the sound of my own voice, and number two, it's because 
if I talk about my ideas in a room like this, and somebody in this room runs off and steals my ideas, the other 99 people in the room will be, that's exactly like that idea that guy came up with on the stage. So what I'm effectively doing is crowdsourced copyright. Okay? I'm throwing it out there as a verbal contract to say, I'm making a game called Mona Lisa in which a Renaissance robot invented by Da Vinci has interchangeable parts in order to rob 16th and 15th century strongholds from other great masters of the Renaissance. That's the game that I'm making in Mona Lisa. I'm six months into development. I'm six months away. It includes art forgery. It includes a whole bunch of wonderful steampunk. Um, well, we call it spring punk, really. It's sort of pre-steam. But I tell you all about that because I assume, number one, you guys have all got your own ideas that you're trying to push. And secondly, now everybody knows that Mona Lisa is mine. OK? Small group, but it's growing. OK. But don't just whip it out, OK? That's the second part of tip one. By whipping out your game and dropping it in their lap, that goes back to one of the first things I said. You're saying, will you sleep with me? Will you be my wife? It's not going to work like that. It's going to be a casual relationship. If they ask to see it, you show it to them. But if you just walk up and say, I got something you're going to want to see, that's not going to go over so well. Okay. Confidence is fine. It's easy to mistake for arrogance. And the subset of that, um, I'm skipping the subset. <whistles> Going on. Tip two. Satisfy her orally. I was hoping for more of, the, uh, <laughs> more of an eyebrow raise with that one. What I mean by that is get away from a script. Get away from a linear script and get yourself into a game script. All of you guys are gamers. You know how nodes work. The fact is, the conversation, if it's not a presentation like this, I, I can say as much as I like over the course of 45 minutes to an hour, and you guys can't stop me. But if you're in a conversation, she might say, hang on a minute, I want to hear about your finances. And if you end up using unsatisfying oral techniques such as these, I'll get to that all in good time. I've lost my place. Hang on a second. If you're whipping through this 25-minute presentation because you had a 25-minute meeting, and she's like, not interested in the content. I want to know about your business model. And you suddenly go, ah, uh, business model. Let's see, that's it. 18 minutes into my presentation, and then I'm going to have to come back around. You've, you've lost the conversation. It stopped being a conversation. You've stopped knowing your stuff inside and out. And, uh, and the magic is gone. The spark is out. OK? So uh, you've got to be prepared to shift gears. And what have I got here? Um, yes, I suppose what I want to say is treat everyone like she's the one. OK? I've got no, no text for that one. But treat everyone you meet as though she is the one that you are going to marry one day. And I mean you're talking interns and PAs and uh, the, the publishers and the, the people who are working the booth, everything like that. Treat everyone with the respect that, that you would like to have treated to you. Because today's PA is tomorrow's editor and today's assistant is tomorrow's CEO. Everyone you talk, if you're sort of arsy to the people who are you know are not the person you're there to talk to, that'll get back up the chain. Okay? So that's another piece. It's not directly associated with the, uh, the pitch, but it is sort of the surrounding of the pitch. It's you as a person. Okay? You want enthusiasm without delusion. You want confidence without arrogance. And you want necessity without desperation. Those points there, I mean, there's a fine line on each of those things. But your enthusiasm without delusion, that's you being excited about a game without saying it's going to be the best, very best game ever you've ever seen in your entire life ever. Okay? That's delusion. But enthusiasm is like, I got something great going on. Confidence without arrogance, you're going to want to see this. That's the arrogant part. Confidence is, I think you're going to like what, you want to see, what you're about to see. Right? And necessity without desperation, that's, um, I think this is going to work, as opposed to, please, can we make this work? Tip three, your equipment will let you down. And don't worry, it does happen to the best of us. <laughs> uh, you should be able to pitch with absolutely nothing. Like I said, you should be able to patch, pitch during a family dinner with the TV on, with SpongeBob, to a six-year-old. If you know your product inside and out, you should be able to pitch when all else fails. And 
in this, like, you know, live demos, sometimes they go right, sometimes they go wrong. But in speaking of distractions, I think when you've got a three-minute pitch or a five-minute pitch or a certain amount of time with somebody and you bring a copy of your game and you think, I'm just going to give them the game and see them play it for a little while, unless you know exactly what that game is going to do, it could make or break the pitch. As well, if you hand it to them, they're distracted by that while you're talking to them, and you're also distracted by that while you're talking to them. So during the conversation, oh, hang on, we just, uh, uh, yeah, you're going to have to press A. Anyway, the financial model, no, press A. A is the other button? A, yes. Uh, sorry, now back to the financial model. No, that's B. Uh, you've got to actually get past that point, and then, yeah, okay, anyway, we're back. The conversation stops being a conversation and just turns into a bumble of words as you try to make them make their way through your game. Okay? My tip is bring a sizzle reel. Bring a two-minute version of the best part of your game and say, this is actual gameplay footage. You can watch it while we talk, but you don't have to touch it, and I don't have to touch it. We know exactly how long it's going to be, and so by the time we reach the end of that, I know what section of my talk I'm going to move on to. What do I got left? Tip four, this is an easy one, wash your junk. By that I mean nobody wants to touch a screen that looks like this. Okay, it's a very basic, it's a hygienic thing, but hand somebody a pristine screen and it'll certainly go. It, it, won't, it won't win the pitch for you, but it'll make an impression. Tip five, moving on. Do not apologize for your inadequacies. Okay, this is a very difficult one. I'll say especially for the British and the English, who are very good at understatement. But when it comes to inadequacies, a lot of people get up and they say, I'm sorry, you're probably not going to have a good time with this. It's not a very good demo. We really wanted to have a little bit more built before we came here, but I'm just going to show it to you. And I hope, oh, there's a bug there, but no, go the other way. And everything becomes one big, my game is not good enough. What you have to do is come in with the mentality that you've arrived with exactly the demo you wanted build, built and with exactly the stage of development that your company is supposed to be in at this stage. Okay? You have to get over the idea of apologizing for a bad pitch or apologizing for not being that funny or apologizing for uh, whatever's going to come out of your mouth. Just go with it and say that's exactly what it was for. Don't justify things, and by that I mean Look at the background. Uh, yeah, you know what? We were going to make it pink, but instead we decided to make it blue. And I think the blue works better, but I'm still not sure. What do you think of the pink? That's you drawing attention to something that you don't necessarily like that they may not even have noticed. And at that point, it opens up the question of, uh, yeah, pink. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't have gone with that. So you're justifying before they even ask. And they've heard every excuse. That's the other thing. With 50 meetings a day, They've heard every excuse about why the development is not as far along as it is, and no development is ever as far along as they want it to be. So just roll with what you've brought. And finally, in the couple of minutes I have left, the word more. Now more is a very important word when it comes to uh, talking to publishers, funders, anything like that, any partner that you want to get. And that, by the word more, what I mean is tell them a little and have them ask for a bit more. You give them a little bit more than that, but still leave them hanging, and they go a little bit more than that. If you give them a title that they like, they might want to ask for a log line. You give them a log line, and they'll continue on to the first sentence. If they like the first sentence, you can go on to the paragraph. If you finish the paragraph, you get a page. If you finish the page, you get a document. Continue, continue, continue. Every piece of that is make sure that every single sentence, if your first sentence of your pitch is my game is a game that is about uh, platformer puzzling in a world that takes place underwater. Now that is not going to make me ask for more because I can relate that to other things that have gone on in the past. But if your first sentence is something that intrigues me with the narrative or the characterization, you know, Disposable Steve lives in a world where concrete and paper and clones can be made of oneself where he goes forward. Um, and he's allowed to send his clones out into the world. Well, that sounds interesting. I want you to tell me more about it. And then I can go on and say, well, the thing about Disposable Steve is a bit of a, um, let's call it a uh, point-and-click adventure that's dialogue-driven. And through it, you're actually uh, using each of the individual mentalities of the clones that you're creating in order to find the original Steve who's gone missing. Now, I like to think that sounds like an interesting story. And you keep on going and you tell more. They ask about the finance. They ask about the gameplay. It goes on. But the key is to always think that 
if there's a point in the conversation where they're not asking for more anymore, it's possible that you've given out all your cards. And another situation that I want to tack on to the end of this is if I, if I have a project that I'm pitching to uh, a publisher and the publisher doesn't like the one I have, I should have another one in the bag. Don't lose the opportunity. Okay? If you've got a second, a second game, I've got another one here that I could show to you. It's in early development. Can't really go forward with it just yet. If you've got more ideas, then that means you're not a one-hit wonder. You are a company that is thinking about its own future. So you're not making one game. You are building a company. So seven seconds to go. Love and partnership is like a fire. All the perfect conditions need to come together, heat and fuel and environment. Everything needs to work out. Now, more or less, you want your fire to be like this. But in most situations, the fire ends up being a little more like this. Okay, It's this magical situation where it's like, oh my god, I think this may actually work. Now, if this relationship is a fire, what does that make you guys? That's right, you're the sexy fireman. No, you're not. You are the spark that sets off the fire. All the tinder is down there, all the kindling, everything is ready to go, and the situation has been put into the best possible light for a fire to start. And if you can get the fire started with a decent pitch, then this could happen, and then this could happen, and then this could happen. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs>